Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Mandek, and I'm a member of the TIFF Next Wave Committee, and it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you, welcome you to tonight's In Conversation with Jay Bearshell. Um, this event is co-presented by TIFF Next Wave, the heartbeat of year-round programming for youth audiences at TIFF. Steered by a committee of 12 teenage film enthusiasts, TIFF Next Wave hosts its own festival every February, tags films of youth interest at the festival in September, and supports and plans events year-round that bring young film lovers together to connect over all things movies. On behalf of TIFF, I would like to thank our lead sponsor, Bell, our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal Paris, and Visa, and our major public supporters, the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario, and the Ontario Art Council, and the City of Toronto. We would also like to thank donors and members like you for supporting TIFF's charitable mission of bringing the power of film to life 365 days a year. Uh, just a few reminders, we ask that you please put your phones on silent. Taking photos or recording video is not allowed at any point during the event, but we encourage you to tweet afterwards using the TIFF hashtag ICWBearishell. During the audience Q&A following the onstage discussion, we ask that you wait for the microphone to reach you before asking your question. In addition to those joining us in person, we have many others across Canada and beyond joining us via our live stream. For any post-secondary students and faculty in the audience, we're excited to be screening the film Goon, followed by an onstage discussion with Jay Baruchel tomorrow at 11 a.m. Tickets are free and will be available from the box office tomorrow morning. Just show your student ID. And now, it is my great pleasure to introduce tonight's host. He is a senior programmer here at TIFF and oversees a Canadian selection at the festival as well as our annual celebration of Canadian cinema, the Canada's Top Ten Film Festival. Please join me in welcoming Steve Greystock. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. You introduce me every time. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here um, and introduce, uh, to introduce Jay Baruchel and, and to host this uh, in conversation with. Jay's one of our finest actors. He was born in Ottawa. Grew up in Montreal's Notre Dame de Grasse neighborhood. Began his acting career at a very young age with appearances on TV shows like Are You Afraid of the Dark? Starring role on My Hometown and eventually a co-host for Popular Mechanics for Kids alongside Alicia Cuthbert. <laughs> Went on to star in uh, Judd Apatow's much beloved sitcom Undeclared. He had small but highly memorable parts in films like Almost Famous and Million Dollar Baby. He had key roles in some of the biggest comedies in the last 15 years from Knocked Up to Tropic Thunder. Voiced the lead character Hiccup in DreamWorks' long-running film series How to Train Your Dragon, as well as starring in the lovely romantic comedy She's Out of My League, and starred in action and fantasy films like Robocop and Sorcerer's Apprentice, and the largely unclassifiable end-of-the-world comedy This is the End. <laughs> he has worked with people like Nicolas Cage, Scott Speedman, Kristen Bell, Ben Stiller, Robert Downey Jr., Jack Black, Kurt Russell, Seth Rogen, James Franco, and a wildly diverse group of directors ranging from Judd Apatow to Roger Avery, Clint Eastwood to Mike Douse, and his longtime collaborators, as, as I mentioned before, Seth Rogen, Evan Goldberg, and Jacob Tierney, one of my favorite filmmakers, and of course, David Cronenberg. He's always been proudly Canadian, often referencing it specifically in his roles in American movies, and he's divided his time almost equally between American and Canadian projects. Uh, the latter group includes uh, films like The Trotsky and Good Neighbors, Fetching Cody, Just Buried, Real Time, Art of the Steel, all of which played Tiff, and of course, Goon, which he co-wrote with Evan Goldberg and stars in, and which also played Tiff. Uh, recently, he completed work on the second season of Man Seeking Woman, one of the most hilarious comedies I've ever seen, and his directorial debut, Goon 2, Last of the Enforcers. Roger Ebert once said of Baruchel that his work, he seems like someone we might actually have known outside of a movie, which is high praise for any actor. We're going to start this with, uh, uh, with uh, one of my favorite scenes in uh, Jay's body of work, uh, a clip from This Is The End, uh, directed by Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg. Jay, right? Yeah.
Thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I thought we'd start maybe by, um, I think more than any, uh, any actor I can think of, maybe, maybe Seth, but you consistently identify yourself as Canadian both uh, off screen and on. Uh, do you want to talk about that's not that common or hasn't been that common in the, in the past? Yeah, it, it wasn't for a long time, I guess. I, I, um, I don't know. It was never an option in my family. Like, I was kind of, I was raised in a house uh, where we, you know, were told that uh, and believe that this is like the, the best country in the world. And, uh, you know, you should do what you can to serve it. And so this is all to say that, like, the, the sort of moving to the States as some kind of big brass ring was never kind of part of the dialogue at our supper table. Do you get, uh, I, I noticed I was watching a, a number of clips and interviews with you and sometimes when you, when you say, when you mention that, I, I think there was a, you were on a talk show and you mentioned Kenmore, Alberta and people looked at you blankly. Oh right, you're from Canada. That's right, I know, I know. It was, it, it was Fallon, I think. Yeah, he yeah. had to qualify that it was, I said, uh, I was talking about forklift operators from Can Canmore and he said, oh yeah, yeah, in Canada. That's, that's, that's in Canada. I was like, as if everyone's viewing experience would have been terribly ruined had he not colored it with that. <laughs> well, it's good the joke to... was solid regardless, is my point. <laughs> it's, it's good to contextualize. I, I suppose, yeah. yeah. Just trying to rep Canmore whenever I get the chance. <laughs> Hopefully no one's here from Canmore, but uh, if not, we'll apologize later. The, uh, um, the uh, uh, and, and you've, I mean, you've, your your uh, your identification as Canadian extends to um, uh, there's that famous scene in Knocked Up with the tattoo. Mm -hmm. is that, uh, where did the the tattoo had a unique history? I think right. Yeah, I mean it was basically just uh, I was 21 and I was working on a uh, a terrible. Well, I shouldn't. Oh Jesus Christ! I, I was. <laughs> I was, <laughs> Less than memorable. Yeah, there you go. I was, I was working. <laughs> I should always be thankful for I'm, anybody. Thank you for hiring me, whoever's hired me. Uh, but uh, no, it was, it was a particularly dire stretch uh, down in the States. And I, um, I remember that I had recently gotten a tarot card reading and I had asked the... Uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> Do you think you're better than me? I, I, <laughs> I, uh, I and I had. I remember I had. I was like 20 or 21, and I had asked what I guess in hindsight is a pretty, fucking morbid question. I was just like, um, <laughs> I said, uh, "Am I going to be in Canada the rest of my life?" And she said, "Yeah." And then I said, "Am I going to die in Canada?" And then she looked at the cards and said, "No." And I was like, "What? Oh no!" <laughs> And so, so I pictured, immediately I pictured myself on some desert island, you know, um, with a little hat or like a fort fashioned out of coconuts and odds and ends, and then, um, which is probably not how I die. Uh, but the point is, I just like, every time I laughed, it, it took on this incredibly fatalistic quality. To this day, to this day, every time I leave Canada, I'm always like, well, oh, I've had a good run so far. <laughs> this, might, this might be the one, so. Um, so I wanted them to know where where to send my corpse. Basically, that's that's where I got the I got the. So it was like care of Canada. Uh, <laughs> as long as it ended up somewhere in in Canada, I'm not precious. Just just not Canmore. Even uh, Canmore. Uh, <laughs> you got it's cool. Uh, You're welcome. Also, you, you also had the tattoo came from. Uh, they had to oh, do it off the. Traced it out of my passport. Yeah. Literally traced it. Yeah. Brought my, so it's uh, like super official. It's the real deal. Yeah. yeah. No, it is the the proper ten points. Um, they are equidistant to each other, and uh, yeah, no, it's it's terrific work. <laughs> it's, it's held up really well course. too. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. Um, I thought we'd maybe start by talking. Uh, well. Start at the the beginning. Uh, you, your first major movie role was in was in uh, Clint Eastwood's film Million Dollar Baby. Was it sort of daunting? To yeah, just a bit. Yeah, because um, he he's still to this day the only person I've ever worked for that if my granddad was still alive would have been even remotely impressed by. You know, like because like as 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 big a fan as I am of David Cronenberg and Ben Stiller, you know. 
<laughs> Robert Rodepel had no idea who the hell either of them were, right? But like Clint Eastwood is Clint Eastwood. And um, so I just remember, I remember thinking, I was like, now is not the time to fuck up. You know, I, I really, I did not want to blow this one. I, I uh, and it was a weird thing. I just, I, I read for it. And, um, and then like over two months went by and I had heard nothing. And I was like, just assume, okay, well, that's that, that then. That was, it was a fun little morning. Um, and they're like, all right, uh, do you like Mystic River? I was like, yeah, I guess. Like, do you want to be in his next one? And I was like, yeah, fuck, sir, sounds good to me. And then I was like, oh, shit, he, he hired me, you know? And, uh, and then, like, and I, I prepared to the best of my ability, or so I thought. And then I got down there, and it was, like, morning one where, like, there's Morgan Freeman, there's Hillary Swank, and there's Clint fucking Eastwood. And I'm just like, oh, Jesus Christ almighty, I'm really in the shit now. Um, <laughs> But it, it sort of, it, it was kind of, uh, I learned two pretty important things on that movie, not to get super kind of hokey, was like, the first day I was obviously scared shitless. And, and so after like every take, I'd say, I'd say, how was that, sir? How was that, sir? And he's like, oh, that was fine, that was fine. And I'm like, fuck. Like I already, I was like playing the scenario in my head, like, can we get this weird skinny kid out of here and find, hire someone else that knows what they're doing, you know? And, and I, and I guess Morgan Freeman could see me sort of the, the wheel spinning, so he leaned over and he said, you know, if he doesn't say anything, it means he likes it. And I was like, oh, fuck. And it was this light bulb moment that, like, I swear, it's a thought that had never occurred to me before that, which was um, if he feels that he's got what he needs, whether or not I felt that I got there or how I... My, what I'm trying to say is an actor's opinion of their work is utterly irrelevant, Tr truthfully. He hired me to do a job, right? Mm -hmm. And if given, if in that given time I did what he's going to use me for, how does it matter how I feel about it or how uncomfortable or confident? Like, yeah, that was a good one. Well, fuck, who gives a shit if it was a good one for you? Did he like it? You know? And 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 from that point on, I stopped. Like, you know, I I had what I think a lot of actors have, which is this habit of just just one more. Can you just let me try one more time? Let me try one more time. I know I can get better. I know I can get better. And and. You don't, number one, I, I don't think. Um, number two, it doesn't matter. It, it's, it's the boss. If the boss is happy, then I'm happy. And I don't know that like I'd still be able to show up on set every day if I didn't think that way, you know, because it's murder to constantly be beholden to other people's opinions. So when I was able to differentiate myself from that, that was, that was an absolutely huge one. Yeah. Does it, was it, um, did you, uh, did, did did, has, has his sort of approach, did, have you encountered that again? Like the sort of non, very, is that very unique amongst rarely. directors? It is, um, but it's like sort of everything about his set is unique amongst directors. Like it's, it's um, deceptively the, the easiest set you'll ever be on, right? And um, everyone knows each other. They've been there together. Uh, the, the new additions are like three films in. Some people have been making films with him since the 70s. But it's all the well, same Freeman's kind like of four or five. I what's think. that? Well, Morgan Freeman. It's four yeah, or no, five, I know. I yeah, and there's a bunch of like it's a, it's a real posse and it's a real and 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 I was like floored that we were able to show up two hours later than the average than any aver the average start date. Like my our days on that movie on Million Dollar Baby, I get there like nine fifteen. I was watching TV in my hotel room by seven thirty every single day, and the movie finished up two days ahead of schedule. Movies don't finish ahead of anything. Yeah. <laughs> His do, right? And it's because he has confidence in the people he's put together. He's hired them for a reason. He lets them do their thing. And I remember asking someone on set, I was like, so that's a pretty good hookup, man. Everyone sees, like, he's like, yeah, just don't fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> and like no one, do you do you want to be the one guy on set that like Clint is disappointed in? No, I don't think so. And and so like everyone chills and has a good time. Then the minute he stands up and goes to speak, everyone drops what they're doing, listens to him, and then just attacks what they have to do as quickly as they can. And like it seems obvious that that's how a set should run. Uh, but you know, I I've been on sets since 1995, and I've probably been on like three or four that worked well. Yeah. Honestly, 
it's it always like, seems like chaos. The industry yeah. standard is for it to be chaos. Yeah. Yeah. Was he, um, I, he I heard that you actually argued politics with him, too. I did a little bit, yeah. yeah. Was he <laughs> surprised? Or? I, I, I think he was, like, psyched to have a con I, Who knows? He might have just, he's probably just humoring me, right? As I, I had the misfortune of sitting next to me in between takes. And, <laughs> and um... And I, but I remember that it, it, our conversation ended with me saying, well, I suppose I'm just a pinko, and him laughing and pointing at me as he walked away. So I, <laughs> I like, called my mom. I was like, I've lived to, to have Clint Eastwood call me a pinko, or call myself a pinko and have him agree, rather. That's, a, that's high press. That's a big one. Yeah. That's a big one. Why don't we, uh, why don't we take a look at uh, uh, one of the scenes. Uh, we're going to do two clips back to back. Uh, Million Dollar Baby, uh, um, one of the key scenes, and then we're gonna uh, look at a scene from uh, one of your first lead roles. I think your first lead role in, in, a, in a feature, uh, Fetch and Cody, a film by Terrific. David Ray that yeah. was shot That's out a deep in, cut. Uh, but it's also, uh, it's, uh, we sh I should set it up. It's about a, you play a character who's sort of living. Um, on the margins. On the margins. And uh, he's actually trying to uh, rescue his girlfriend from a particular fate. Yeah. And that's what he's discussing. It's, uh, oh, cool. There's time machines and stuff. But... And heroin. Lots of heroin. Yes. Uh, I'm not even kidding. That's actually. No, that's, that's pretty accurate. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it's a great performance. So Thank you. Uh, why don't we take a look and at And I those... agree. <laughs> <laughs> Let's roll this. <laughs> I, I I I wanted to. I love the way that 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 particular the performance in Fetch and Cody jumps back and forth between like heartbreak and kind of comic exasperation. Yeah. The uh, the time machine, as all time machines do, there it's just a big sofa chair with Christmas bulbs on it. So basically, uh, yeah. it's, it's somewhat low budget. Just a uh, bit. Uh, but it's uh, I mean it sort of oscillates back and forth between. Uh, you know the, the the comedy, and then that sort of like it's crazy. tragic sort of heartbreak. That's yeah, through. was that what drew you to the role? Or? Yeah, a hundred percent. I had to like fight super hard to get in that movie. He 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 was not interested in hiring me, the director. And I remember like distinctly my manager. I had just done Million Dollar Baby, and I remember him being like, "I don't know what's with this guy in Vancouver. I just told him that you worked with Clint Eastwood, and he's like, ah." I just don't feel he's right for it. So like I, I put myself on tape a whole bunch. I, I like wouldn't take no for an answer and and uh, cuz what I what I what I dug about it was the chance to do kind of uh, what to me is the for me the, the height of of all acting is when you can when you can find comedy and tragedy in the same moment when when you can make something incredibly heavy that's also really really funny, you know, like that's to me, Peter Sellers' career, in in a in a nutshell, is is just this this ability to make people incredibly uncomfortable, make people feel a great deal for him, but uh, but be laughing the whole time. 
Cool. The the um, the the other uh, is it, is that what draws you? to roles in general, specific roles in general? Is it that sort of layer? Or I mean, it's, there, there, I don't know that there's any one thing. You know, for me, it's like there's, there's like a criteria, and hopefully, uh, dream job, all of them are met, but that doesn't happen very often. But it's like, is this something that I would spend money to watch? Like, is this a flick that I would, would blip on my radar if I was just, you know, looking at it on Netflix or something? Is this something I would want to watch? Um, is this gonna be a fun gig, you know? I'm a, is this like, seem like, I, and that sounds sort of like an easy one, but yeah, I'll say like, I'll, I'll be 34 in April, and so a meaningful way to spend my time, like the the the, the work itself has to be kind of good too, you know? And um, is it gonna be with interesting people, and is it gonna be someplace kind of cool, you know? And, and ideally, it's all of those things. Is it, uh, is it, is there a difference? I mean, this is, uh, you, as I said, you've oscillated between sort of indie work and work in Canada and work in the U.S. Um, how, how do you, um, how, the, the, the role in Million Dollar Baby, it's, it's not a huge role, not a lot of speaking mm -hmm. lines, but it's, it's also, it carries a lot of weight. I mean, it's really the sort of emblem of optimism in the yeah, film. Yeah. Do you approach that differently than you would if you were in, like, virtually every scene, which is what goes on in Fetching Cody, is it? I mean, you, the, on, the, on, the only difference is you, um, because you're not in every scene, you have the, the luxury of more homework, I think. You know, I was able to, <clears throat> in preparing for Million Dollar Baby, I was able to, like, distill it all down to the, on, on the, the five scenes that I was in. And, you know, it's it's... I don't want to say easier, uh, but it's just slightly less labor intensive and there's that much less to wrap your head around. And, and as a result, you can kind of have a bit more fun when there's a very finite specific amount of stuff to do. When you're the beginning, the middle, and the end, when you're the A to Z of the whole thing, it, it, um, that, that's a bit trickier. But, but I honestly think that whatever the gig is, however much time you're on camera, and regardless of the genre, the gig is always the same. Always, always, always the same, which is to serve the story and to and and to add to it if they're if it needs adding to, right? And that's like an improv's only a good improv. Doesn't even if it's a funny one, it's only really good if it actually somehow is truthful. If that makes any sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I love the I love the moment in the in the million million dollar baby by the way when you. You're, you're staring at the glove. Oh, like yeah, it, yeah. Like he's just trying to, a that's right, no, just trying to so figure central. out how to throw a punch. That's his whole thing is he spends his whole life, rather than throwing a punch, just staring at his hand. Yeah. And talking about it, yeah. yeah. Um, the, uh, um, after, after Million Dollar Baby, you, you, you went, as I mentioned before, you went back and forth between Hollywood and Canada, kind of all over Canada, really. You did... Uh, uh, you shot Just Buried on the East Coast with Chaz Thorne and Rose Byrne and uh, Randall Cole's Real Time in Hamilton, in Hamilton with yeah. Randy Quaid. And yeah. you started in I'm Reed Fish in the U.S. and mm -hmm. had a seminal role in Knocked Up. Um, do you see a, a, a difference between, like, Canadian and American productions in general? Or is there something that draws you to the Canadian stuff separately from the American, or is it all the same in terms of roles? I mean, yeah, it's... it's uh, the fringe benefits, I you know, just, just like you usually have way more time in the states to do stuff and way more resources, so so there's that, you know. Uh, but that's a blessing and a curse, you know, because like, you know, I don't know that it's always necessarily a good thing to have six months at your disposal to tell this story, you know. I I think that you lose. In my experience, I have a hard time. Um, I'm be uh, hard time keeping my my sort of interest and in keeping it going when it's when you're showing up the same place every day for half a year. You know, there, there's something about necessity being the mother of invention. And if you've got you know 30 days or less, shooting days I should say or less to to tell your story, it forces decisions. You know, that, that that's the other thing. It's like, and I guess this is a cousin. This is a sort of a connected to a larger kind of. A problem, but just sort of issue or phenomenon, which is that um, uh, filmmakers are forced less and less to make decisions. Uh, in, in the there's a bunch of different contributing factors, but there's like, you know, I, I remember reading this real interesting article uh, that that Soderbergh uh, it was an interview with him or something he wrote, but it was last year. But he basically said how um, staging is like a dead art form in movies now. 
you know, true blocking, true, you know, like sort of letting, knowing every moving piece in terms of your actors and everything and everything, because um, that requires people to live with that decision. And in this sort of age uh, that we're in now, it's a lot of covering your ass and making sure you have enough possible story options and enough possible this, possible that, which is, th there's merits to that as well, but then in a Multitude certain point. of camera angles. Yeah. Uh, you know, but, but sort of like, so again, I, I do sometimes think that if you're a bit more zeroed in and you have less time, you're kind of forced to make a decision, which is only a good thing to me. So it's not a difference necessarily between indie and like bigger studio stuff. No, right? the the only other thing would be that like up here, I you know could be an uh, an actor. I, I I wasn't certainly you know down down there. You're very much beholden to the last gig you had, mm -hmm. and that's what they see you as. And and up here, you know, for whatever combination of reasons, I got the chance to play more interesting dudes usually. So, well, it's a pretty wide range and like links too. So. Thank you. Um, the uh, I don't think there's a wider range than say like the gambling addict in real time to the or the uh, that's one know, of my the, favorites the Undertaker in Just Barry oh yeah like, those are crazy those are both crazy um, the uh, uh, I was thinking maybe there wouldn't be a difference because you work with so so many Canadians in Hollywood actually with yeah Rogan well, that's the other thing and yeah. Dean DeBlas and yeah. uh, Paul Haggis wrote to uh, Wherever I Am is Sovereign Canadian Soil. So <laughs> it helps when, uh, when they agree. Um, so you'd, uh, you, you mentioned uh, in, in numerous interviews that you'd always wanted to shoot in your hometown, particularly in the area of Montreal mm -hmm. where you grew up, so uh, Notre Dame de Grasse. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing the Trotsky was... Uh, Huge. Huge. It wasn't, not, not only did we get to shoot an NDG, it was my first time working in Montreal in a decade at that point. I, like the last time before the Trotsky, the last time I had filmed anything in Montreal uh, was like Popular Mechanics. Um, was, so I was like pretty excited. But like, it, you know, like it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a weird one. It becomes a novelty when you leave for work, you know, like to, to, to be driving to work and hear, um, you know, the local radio telling about traffic stuff and for it to actually be of import to you and affect your day is, like, pretty cool. <laughs> you know, I, I, I never get to have that. She's always, at, because my job's always in a suitcase, so it was, uh, it was very, very special for me. Um, and it's, uh, d how, how did you get involved with it? You actually knew Jacob beforehand. Yeah, the, the weird thing about, um, so uh, Jacob and I uh, lived on the same street when I was five and he was eight. Um, and uh, his Jacob Tierney, the director, Jacob Tierney, yeah, yeah. the director right. of uh, the Trotsky. Uh, his uh, sister Bridget uh, is in the room right now. I've known her since I was about yeah eleven or twelve. Their mother was my uh, substitute teacher throughout high school, <laughs> literally. Yeah, and uh, and so like we were just like we and and when I started uh, acting in Montreal when I was twelve, to be kid actor. Uh, is narrows things to be kid actor in English or Montreal narrows things even and you know and so uh, we we all aspired to be Jacob all the guys that kind of got into it at that same time we all aspired to be Jacob um, and so I, 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 he doesn't tire of hearing that actually no 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 he does not no no um, uh, but uh, but yeah and it was just like he sent me this kind of crazy script and I and I. I'll be perfectly honest, first time I read it, it was kind of just completely lost on me. I just didn't know my way in uh, or how, what, how it was meant to sound and blah, blah, blah. And then I one chat with him about it and, um, and yeah, and so flash forward, uh, done, he's directed me in two movies. I just acted in a movie he's starring in called Love Sick. Um, when I showed him the rough cut of Goon 2 over Christmas, that was like, by far the most stressful screening I've done so far, because if I have a mentor, it'd be him, and uh, he liked it, which is huge. Yeah. Cool. Of course, what else was he gonna say? But. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's take well, let's take a look at the uh, Trotsky. Of course, the uh, Jay plays a character who believes that he is the reincarnation of the famous Soviet radical revolutionary Leon Trotsky. But you'll get that from the clip. So Probably. Can, yeah. It's abundantly clear. Yeah.
But yeah, yeah. I, 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 you know, I just like would, um, my my command of uh, Russian is is quite poor, um, non-existent actually. Uh, so so I, I couldn't like get a lot of the nuance, but I could see at the very least where he put his hands, which for me. Uh, is an issue on every movie <laughs> is where I'm going to put my hands so as I'm talking uh, so it, uh, it gave me a spot to put them cool uh, that, that is and important. we're all better for it <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I, did, I mean, it's interesting that it started, like, the posture was sort of important because, I mean, both the three uh, clips we've looked at, it's, uh, a lot of it's about how you occupy the physical space. Is that, like, what you start with when, when, you, when you work on a characterization? I guess, oh, yeah. I guess it just comes from just always having a weird body that moves strange. Like, I, I, I <laughs> like, uh, yeah, I mean, like, my, my sort of heroes. You know, if I've ever been kind of funny to anybody, it's it's purely because I've been, in my mind, just ripping off Rowan Atkinson and Michael Richards since I was 12 years old. Um, so good guys to rip off. I think so. So yeah, f physical anything is is my favorite shit. Yeah. Is it? I mean, when you when you did this, uh, do you know the story about Jacob when it was uh, when he first wrote the Trotsky. Oh, that it was serious. Yeah, it wasn't a comedy. It wasn't a comedy, and it was for him to star in. It was like, yeah, it was like, yeah. Yeah, yeah and then um, I think people were, like, giving him shit, like, y y you know, this is kind of ridiculous, that this, you know, this is, this, is, this is kind of comedic. And he was like, and I remember him telling me, he's like, I had the thought that, oh, I like funny movies. Maybe this could be funny. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> he, he actually told a story once where it was like, yeah, so I sent it to this a former manager or agent, and they liked everything I did. And, <laughs> and I was anxiously waiting their call, yeah. and it didn't come for several days or something like that. Yeah. Or Jake, Jake was waiting for the call. And, and, and finally, he, he, he got them on the phone, and she said, he said, so what did you think? And she said, well, and she famously loved everything yeah. he did. And, and, and he said, what do you think? And, she said, well, you've written better. Ah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a good uh, one. But I mean, it obviously changed when you, I mean, one of the great things about the, the, the film uh, is, is the way it, um, uh, well, you're, you're virtually in every shot and you really care, a lot of it's about balancing between the character's sort of pretty out there uh, belief in who he is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, being the reincarnation of Trotsky and making him, uh, a, you know, a likable person. Yeah, or, or in sort of deciding when to uh, to use really annoying uh, terminology, uh, pivot away from or lean into <laughs> um, <laughs> how uh, how sort of arch he is, you know. Um, and, the, and there's times where the, the story and the movie and everything around it requires him to be a cartoon, and then, but, you know, it's hard to follow a cartoon you know, and, and give a shit about it the whole time. So, like, it was like, the, and that that makes it interesting for me is to, like, find the moments to be just, like, accessible. When, when, when am I, you know, helping the audience see the story and, and when am I performing for them? Was that, I mean, a lot of that seemed to be in, in the scenes with Emily Hampshire. Uh, Big the, time. The woman he pursues. Who's all that stuff, yeah. Happily named, has the same name as Trotsky's first wife. Exactly and, right, yeah. That's yeah. All, all, the, all that great stuff, yeah. And then in, in terms of the shitty review that Jacob's manager gave, I, I just, I was like, because I, I got, I, the best one I ever got is like, I, 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 <laughs> I won't, I won't mention the movie because it's out and it's being out and a lot of people like it. But I'll, I'll say that I uh, remember years ago, my manager was going to a screening and I, uh, this thing had been kind of a root canal, this job. It was, and I had asked them afterwards, I said, so how was it? And uh, and there was a pause, and I was like, "Well, the movie's not very good." And I was like, "Yeah, I know, I get that." And they said, "And uh, and your and your performance is pretty uninspired." And uh, <laughs> and I remember being like, at first I was like, "What the fuck? I pay you ten percent of my income for this?" And but then I was like, "No, no fucking shit. You're right. Like that's I can't I can't argue with that." I was like, "That's bulletproof logic." And. Because <laughs> it was, I was uninspired, and I'll say this: is like now, if he likes something, I'd fucking mean something. Like that's like, because I was there when he told me that I suck. So yeah. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, I mean, when Jacob really wrote the script, he was quite young. It's like it was yeah. a very serious sort of. Yeah, uh, I, like like as he was, he was a very very serious little man. 
and funny too. Yep. So, uh, um, the uh, um, I wanted to, uh, I, your your politics in high school weren't exactly the same as Leon's, though, right? Jesus were... Christ! Yeah, no, no, um, the polar opposite. In fact, yeah. Um, it's a function of the human character to rebel against your surroundings. So whatever you know, the sort of party line is around you um, that your parents and classmates and and teachers espouse. Like it's human nature to kind of go the other way. And so I went to um, uh, fine arts high school. Uh, the place, the school is called Face. It's just kind of a famous school ridiculous name, hilarious acronym for fine arts core education. Um, we didn't have homeroom, we had family class. Uh, but we, but it, was, it was awesome and like we were all required to do every other class that everyone else at normal school is, but we all had to learn an instrument, all had to sing, all had to paint, and all had to work on the plays. And, um, and it gave us quite a good sort of background for that stuff, but um, you can assume that that is, you know, not a very, uh, not a hotbed of conservatism, you yes. know, and uh, and so, you know, like, uh, and so I, di I distinctly remember, you know, coming back from uh, the summer between uh, grade 10 and grade 11, and, and I was like, really? All of you are bisexual? How did that happen? How did <laughs> all of my class discover their bisexuality this summer? Um, <laughs> and, and so, um, and so just, just to be, just so that there would be a diversity of viewpoint, I started being like, because I was the only guy arguing there <laughs> on behalf of U.S. foreign policy. <laughs> I would wear like a little sweater vest and I would like argue vehemently about the merits of the death penalty and all of this, just like stupid shit, but like, you know, I, I re most kids rebel against their conservative parents and uh, and teachers. Me, I rebelled against my liberal parents and teachers by coming a little Alex P. Keaton for two years. Uh, <laughs> uh, but Clint Eastwood probably would have been cool with it. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, yeah. The uh, um, I thought um, just to pick up on the whole body thing, we'd I, we'd look at uh, uh, next clip. We'd look at was. Uh, is from a completely different film uh, and a completely different method of filmmaking, which is, uh, is probably the biggest film in terms of box office. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Just videos of me masturbating, right? Yeah. We, we you sent told them. me they were for personal. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, and, and in English, it's how to train your dragon, actually. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the figures. So, uh, the figures. Let's, let's, all the <laughs> let's bring out the dragon, please, if we could. Uh, <laughs> sorry. It's okay. So sorry, everyone. I couldn't, have, boy, do I know how to pick them. So, so, so if we could see the, the uh, uh, children's film, uh, <laughs> How to Train Your Dragon, please, the clip.
Uh, it, things get better. Uh, the the uh, I thought we'd, you know, that's probably the most dramatic scene in the film. But it, sure, and it, yeah. uh, but it also, I think, uh, I wanted to show it because it's a very different way to approach a role. And, you know, I mean, do you, uh, when you, when you do voice like, voice work like that, is it uh, do you do it? Is it all solo? Uh, how do you prep for it? I mean, given the fact that, for instance, you talked about the importance of starting up characterization with your body. Yeah, um, it is mostly solo. Uh, on the first movie, I worked with other actors a bit more. Um, on uh, on How to Train Your Dragon two, I think uh, over the course of three years, I think I did two sessions with another actor. Um, the rest, of the, that's because that's like what it shoots about three years. I, I will like once every two and a half months or so, I'll go in and record, you know, two three hours, and um, over the course of three years, and then um, when I wake up and a movie that everyone loves is out, <laughs> um, and uh, and also I do the, the TV series uh, of the How to Train a Dragon that we've been doing pretty much as long as we've been doing the movies too. So. Um, uh, yeah, it's it's weird, um, but they're they're always filming. They're always filming me in the booth, and um, you know I, I don't know if it's just my megalomania, but I'd like to think that some of him he moves a bit like I do. You yeah. know, um, they again they might just be humoring me, but they tell me that that's kind of what they're doing. Um, but uh, no, it's it's weird. It it kind of like. All it does, especially for someone like me, is it, it robs me of my uh, my crutches, you know. Because uh, as yeah, it, it, with, as, with as weird and nasal a voice as I have, that's not my crutch. It's my it's my it's my awkward uh, posture and stuff, and what I do with my hands. And so like I I don't have this to punctuate moments anymore. And so it's it's. Um, yeah, it just it 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 um it forces you to to connect to the words in a th that much stronger. At least I at least I like to think so anyway. And even in a sort of dramatic exchange like that, yeah. it'll all be separate. That's yeah, uh, oftentimes, yeah, it's it'll be just me and the, and and the director, or or like sometimes, like on the TV show, we have a real great shorthand. So if there's ever a real back and forth, we'll play it out like a scene, normal scene. But if like. I have two lines and a big action sequence. Um, what I'll do is like we've gotten to the point where like so eight years I've been playing this character, where I'll like just say the line a bunch of different ways, and they'll be like, "Okay, good, we're good, moving on." <laughs> so, yeah, so there's not a heck of a, a huge amount of direction there. Uh, not, I mean, it's it's like basically it'll it'll come down to like uh, they'll want me to sort and you know like I'll I'll help tell the story with them basically. So like, can you billboard this line and, and hit this one and and there often is like like so they'll be like you know what this might be a nice moment for you to start to feel like this and 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 um you know and and when you have to transition right when a scene is about two things completely and starts from one place and goes to a completely different yeah. thing you know and um and you're the one talking the most so it's on you to make that as seamless as possible right. but, um but yeah I I, uh, I I I love it it's it's like I lucked out I fell utterly arse backwards into these movies. It's like the, the, the greatest thing that's like, you know, I was, I was in um, Hawaii shooting movie Tropic Thunder, and, um, which is by the same company. I've heard of that one. Yeah. <laughs> I never assume everyone is like, as well versed with my resume as I am. Uh, um, <laughs> so, uh, um, which is just the height of assholishness, I would assume. I was working on Tropic, um, and... Uh, <laughs> and fucking no, but uh, <laughs> same same company that does the How to Train Your Dragon movies, DreamWorks, and um, and I uh, I I it was kind of cool. I got sort of two gigs while we were shooting that movie. Um, they were like looking at the the dailies or the rushes or whatever, and were like, well, he he could be the our ugly kid, and she's out of my league. And then uh, <laughs> and they're like, he could be our nerd voice in How to Train Your Dragon. <laughs> And um, and so I, I I literally just like went to this, you know, there's not a ton of recording studios on uh, the Isle of Kauai in Hawaii, but, um, but I went to the one that they have there and um, recorded, uh, and then I, I got the job. And what's weird is that like I'm I've now been involved in How to Train a Dragon longer than either of the directors, uh, writers. I like because I was there when it was a whole nother team. When it was a different vision, it was a whole nother script, going to be a completely different movie, way goofier, 
way shittier. <laughs> it would not, we would not be talking about uh, a franchise if, if that movie had happened. Yeah. But I'm thankful it didn't. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I'm thankful they didn't fire me. And, uh, and yeah, because it's like th these movies mean a great deal to a great deal of people and um and and they transcend so much stuff and they like and and you know when you think back to the stuff you liked when you were a kid you know there's movies i adore that i fall in love with as a grown-up there's meals i have that i love as a grown-up blah 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 none of them hold a fucking candle to any of those when i was a kid yeah. Movies I liked when I was a kid, you know, the meal, the best meal you had when you were a kid. Name, name one moment in your adult life where you had someone who's half that fucking good, right? Yeah, so yeah. You, you just don't. Yeah. So to be a part of something that people are going to, but you remember it for the rest of your life. You know, everyone knows the first time they saw whatever the fuck, right? And so, like, <laughs> I know that these are movies that a lot of kids are, you know, this next generation of filmmakers grew up watching these movies. It's kind of cool to be a part of that. What do you... Yeah, for sure. What, 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 do you, what do you attribute the sort of endurance of the franchise to? Uh, yeah, they're super well done, I think. Like, it just doesn't suck, you know? I, I, I like, <laughs> they give a shit. Like, the story, they take, they take a, Dean really works his arse off on the story, and they, th and they look beautiful. And, you know, I think you've got hell of a, hell of a main character to, uh, to act as a yeah, fulcrum for the whole franchise. Yeah. Um, you could eat off that voice, uh, but uh, I, I would have started with that. So. <laughs> yeah. No, no, they, they they use my voice in fucking Abu Ghraib. Uh, um, but uh, no, I just think it's like it's it's. Um, I think you know there are terrible things that make a lot of money, but there are also good things that make a lot of money, and I think it's one of the good ones. How did you? Uh, you mentioned Tropic Thunder, which sort of led to an, an, uh, Whole bunch the, of shit. the role in uh, She's Out of My League yeah. and, uh, and the, the role of Hiccup. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, that was um, not the easiest shoot, I understand, even though it was in Hawaii. It yeah, was sort of... but, you know, top three, like, greatest gigs of my life. Like, um, yeah, it, it's funny. Uh, you can have a job where the, 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 the work in front of you asks a lot of you, but the vibe is so amazing and what you're doing just cancels it out. So yeah, we like the the, the annoying shit of Tropic Thunder would be like, you know, I was gone for half a year, right? I left I left Montreal on uh, the day before Canada Day and they stopped shooting around American Thanksgiving. And I was and I had only wrapped about a week prior to that. So it was like a big one. Uh, four and a half months on this one island that I didn't leave the whole time. I didn't even go to like uh, uh, Oahu or anything. I was just on this one island, and um, and I was oh poor you, you're on. <laughs> Listen, yeah. <laughs> When's the last time you were staring at palm trees longer than six days? Like they get shit gets old, like any place. Like yeah. <laughs> at a certain point, it looks like Hamilton. Like it's just, it's just <laughs> and and uh, um. But, Possibly more to do in Hamilton. Yeah, yeah. You know, in a weird sort of way. But also, Not so like, Stiller, Ben had, had scouted all of our locations from a helicopter. So they built infrastructure that wasn't featured in the movie that was just to get us there. So there was like bridges and shit that the production built for us to get to our locations. Literally. And so it was like, we'd all pile in the van in front of the hotel. We drive half an hour to the outskirts outside the city. We then drive another 20 minutes into the jungle on this one w one lane windy little thing. There was like a big meter stick. We had to, we had to crest a river every morning, um, and uh, and that island is the wettest place in the world. That mountain gets uh, the highest average rainfall of any place on Earth, and it rains on average 12 times a day there. And every animal in God's cre creation is there. It's beautiful. It's great, but they're all making poo. And you have 12 times a day, it rains. And so what you have is this, this mud that comes up to here that is equal parts dirt and shit. And, and so the big thing on our set was everyone's dropping like flies. Everyone, a lot of people came down with what's called leptospirosis. Yeah, good one, eh? And, um, and the symptoms are like, it looks like it's like a cross between um, food poisoning and uh, I, I, I don't know, but you, you, you shit and puke a lot and you have a headache and you're real tired. Oh yeah, that's the other thing, it's like mono. It's like mono yeah. and food poisoning. 
um, like chocolate and peanut butter, right? The two greatest things ever. Um, <laughs> strangely, though, <laughs> which I was proud of, and then, and then eventually I was like, oh, what's wrong with me? I didn't get sick once. <laughs> And there was a few of us that didn't get sick, and um, and and it and we we were trying to figure out what it was. And I was like, okay, you you grew up on farms. I was like, I grew up around. It's like I'd be lying if I said, you know, I've been cleaning litter box since I was eight years old, and I'd be lying if I said I washed my hands every fucking time I did it. <laughs> so it built up this tolerance. <laughs> Same with, I was in that jungle. I was in that fucking jungle for five months. I didn't get a single mosquito bite. Every day, people, tsh, they'd be like, Jay, you want, I'm like, no, I'm fine. I've been fine the whole time. And at a certain point, I was like, yeah, why? And I was just like, yeah, why? What, <laughs> what are they smelling? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, you know, buzzards flying the other way? Like, <laughs> So uh, I think you've sold us all on where this, the, visiting this island. Uh, <laughs> so we can get we can get the spelling. Uh, <laughs> see um, if you go if you stay at the uh, resort Quest Makaiwa, see uh, a be young bellman named uh, Kaimi. He'll uh, he'll hook you up. <laughs> Tell him, Jace. <laughs> okay. Uh, Those are all real. I didn't. That's not gibberish. That's not real shit. Uh, yeah. I know. Let's move on. You sure? Uh, yeah. You sure uh, wanna, let's see where this I, I think, uh, I think we're gonna thing we're, goes. We're gonna move on to your religious themed movie, which is Goon. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, because it's about hockey, which yeah, is a religious is religion, thing. Yeah. Uh, uh, how did you uh, you you had a, had a key role in it. You're Doug Glatt, the main character's best friend, yeah. and, and you also uh, co-wrote it yeah. uh, with Evan Goldberg. Can you talk a bit about how that started and where the film came from? Yeah, um, so I've known Evan, uh, who writes all the, and directs stuff with Seth Rogen. I've known those guys since we were all like 18. And um, you know, they're sort of, that side of, of their career kind of got going, and, and we all kind of, you know, we were the we we always watched movies together, and always watched TV together, and always you kind know, of shared all of our aspirations and all that stuff. And like, boy, wouldn't it be cool if I got we get one day we get to make these movies and blah blah blah. And, and actually, it's kind of neat to see some of them, like their new thing, Preacher. Like, that's one of them. That was one of the ones that from that era when we were 19, you know, just smoking weed at this house, being like, oh man, this would be great, you know. And I maintain, they will disagree, but I'm going to say it right now. It was my fucking pitch as a TV show, not movies. So I was the one that said it. But anyway, um, so they had, like, all I've ever wanted to do is, is write and direct movies. And, um, so Evan was one of my friends that was nice enough to actually read my first script, who a lot of people didn't because uh, it was uh, 225 pages. <laughs> and, uh, but he was like good enough to read it and, um, and was like, yeah, it's fucking long, but there's something there, you know? And um, so the Lagoon producers uh, found him and, and asked him if he'd be interested. In, he was like, on paper, yes. And then he was like, but I don't know a single thing about hockey. You know, uh, the, they're not big hockey boys, those two. It just was not ever really part of their life. Um, and he knew that I was kind of a bit of a nut when it came to it. And he had read my thing and didn't think it was too terrible and was like, maybe this is something that we could do together. And uh, so, yeah, so then I... Um, we, we kind of came up with this idea, and then I, I banged out the first draft in my uh, bedroom, Montreal, in, in like a month and a half. And then um, five years of back and forth and blah, 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 and all this, and then we finally got to make it into a movie. And it was based on... Uh, uh, yeah, so, I mean, y yes and no. Like, so it is based... Inspired. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, that's probably the closest, but yeah, it's, it's based on a book called Goon, um, the... Uh, Unlikely story of a, oh fuck, I forget. I always forget the subtitle, but it's Adam Fratazio and, and Doug Smith, and uh, which is a true story. Of this guy that um, uh, became a pro hockey player, a hockey player period, very late in life, like started skating at 20 or something, and uh, but was really good with his fists. And uh, this American dude from Massachusetts who got uh, sent to a team in the Maritimes. But when I was reading his story. 
his story was like way more Hollywood than I was comfortable with. Like he gets sent to this team and they win and he gets the girl and all this stuff. And so I was like, let's let's kind of let's let's try and like I'll meet you halfway on it. We'll take this sort of conceit of a, a guy who's not real good at this, finding his like what he's good at with his fists and I like the American going to Canada thing is real cool. And, yeah. Um but I needed to kind of I want to throw some of my own stuff in there and so you know, like Goon has a happy ending. The first movie, uh, it didn't in my fucking script, and they they shot that ending while I was away from set on purpose, <laughs> waiting in a van to drive from Portage La Prairie to back to Winnipeg. And they're like, "Oh yeah, yeah, they'll be in a second. And I'm sitting there in a van, 20 minutes, and then the Highlanders start to come out. And I said, "What are you guys shooting?" I'm like, "Oh yeah, this 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 scene where we score." I was like, "In the final game?" I'm like, yeah. I was like, oh, those bastards. <laughs> But it ends up actually working better than my sad ending. But uh, um, uh, but but I I had all this sort of like the the important thing for me was like uh, my my way into hockey, my understanding of hockey uh, and hockey fighting is all through my dad, and um, and and so for me I I wanted to kind of filter it through him, and I and and I I had you know. The reason we liked fighters in my house was because of my dad. Like, and I was always like, so long before Goon was ever a thing, we were. I think this is why I connected to it so much. As I grew up in a house that was, the heroes were Chris Nyland and all those guys. And uh, and and so, my dad's experience, all of his experiences, I, I couldn't separate his Jewishness from it. And uh, and so that's why, you know, I, I've had the benefit of growing up with a you know, Jewish immigrant father and a. Irish Catholic mother, six of eight kids uh, whose family have been in Canada for 300 years. So I've been able to, th these two things inform a lot, of, I'd like to think a lot of what I think about. And so my dad's experience of, you know, growing up the only Jewish kid in his neighborhood, um, going to the Jewish, you know, not being able to play hockey there, going to the Jewish hood to play hockey of like, you know, skating onto the ice on an all-Jewish hockey team and having parents of the opposing team like throw pennies at the Jewish kids as they went onto the ice and oh man and my dad being the guy that would like fight them all and and I remember being like 21 22 and I was at this uh, Passover Seder and I meet this couple about my folks age and it's a real crazy moment because the the lady tells me that she dated my dad when they were in high school and the dude says he played hockey with dad around the same time and you know the way that my dad made me feel was like the greatest tragedy was that I didn't play sports, right? Like, it's like, and 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 I grew up inheriting this legend of his athletic career, and so I had to finally ask someone who was there. It's like, okay, you can tell me, <laughs> how good was this fucking guy, you know? And he goes, how do I put this? I'm like, here we go. And he he goes, he liked to finish his checks, <laughs> and so like, which dovetailed perfectly with the dad that I grew up with, who was like, yeah, just constantly driving his fist into people's faces, <laughs> so. So, 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 um, and, and the producers, uh, to their credit, and Doug Smith, who is the inspiration, the real Doug, to his credit, like, he was fine with me making the character based on him Jewish. <laughs> and, um, and it just kind of, I don't know, I, I, I drew from a lot of stuff. So that, that the, the movie, I like to think, is like, it has a lot of contributing factors. And you, 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 uh, you, you're directing the sequel you you wrote yeah. uh, with your writing partner Jesse Shabbat yeah and, uh, so far yeah. Uh, um, can you talk a bit about that yeah um, was it did you uh, did you not give any direction at all and just say <laughs> fine or, uh... <laughs> um, no I, I yeah um, I, I'm not gonna compare myself to any of the men I've worked for or women or who anybody I've worked for uh, um, I'll say this that like I definitely had 20 years worth of seeing what a set, you know, what a good set feels like and what a, not, a, not a great set feels like. And, uh, you know, I wanted, if nothing else, like, aside from all of my artistic ambitions of what I'm trying to do with telling this story, I want people involved in this flick. I want, I never want anybody to be miserable to be there. I want everyone to be psyched to be there. I never want anyone to wonder what the hell's going on and why we're not doing something and what we're waiting for. Um, and uh, and I want to want everyone to to give a shit and feel free to contribute because um, I, I want them to like it as much as I do, 
uh, but from a purely utilitarian standpoint, even if I didn't care what they thought of it, the I would get better work out of them if they're invested. And yeah. so, um, so we wanted everyone in part of that movie to sort of feel that they could come to me at any point with anything. And so, you know, uh, every rewrite we did, we would send it out to everyone. Um, involved and not just the rewrite itself but we'd always bullet point exactly what we cha our changes were and why we did them and what we thought the story or ramifications for were for that and it just and everyone kind of gave a shit right and um and so so yeah we we rocked it man it was it was crazy i think like i think most people's sort of first film is like some version of yeah two junkies kicking heroin in an apartment or something it doesn't yeah. it's not a movie with where were we? Sixty plus speaking roles, wow. and like that takes place over the course of eight months or no, no, uh, ten months. Uh, it's got you know a whole hockey league uh, with teams that have to you know all this like there's a lot a lot of moving parts. Um, but uh, and again, it well, took it's us, tough to shoot hockey. It's not an easy thing. to That's shoot, the other so. thing, and and especially when the movie that shot it the best was Goon, and we have to now out, outdo it, right? You know, because like it's not enough for us to make. Like no, none of us are interested in making the the shitty version of Goon, mm -hmm. and it's kind of not even good enough for us to make a movie as good as Goon. Like our lofty ambitions, whether we've met them or not, is to make a better movie than Goon, and um, and so that forces us to sort of, where can it be reinvented, and what can we do differently? What can we, you know. I don't know that improve is necessarily always the word, but just like what's you know, and and shooting hockey is a is a tricky one because there's no country on earth where people have a better uh, are more versed in how hockey is photographed than in yeah. Canada. We all grow up watching it. Well, it's shot so beautifully here, and it's yeah. and it's shot perfectly here. Yeah. That's you know, and so it's what we call you know broadcast, right? Yeah. And so what we wanted to do this time was. We don't want to lose that because that's part of the fun. But how do we bring the audience onto the ice with the boys themselves? And so, and, and by by the way, you can do that, and then not scratch any of the itches you'd get. You know, like here's the thing: we it's not enough to just bring the camera onto the ice with people. We got to bring the camera on the ice with people and still have the hockey action do for the audience what it does when they're watching a goal on TV, yeah. right? So, which is an interesting kind of little sort of uh, criteria that we gave, mission we gave ourselves, um, but we, we fucking did it. And, and the hockey in this movie is absolutely insane. And uh, I, I, am, I am so proud of this movie. I am proud of how it looks and how it feels. And, um, you know, my, my pitch the whole time was Goon 2 is going to be uh, uh, Ben Hur meets Trailer Park Boys. You know, it's... it's <laughs> You know, and, and, and we really think that, like, you come see our flick, we want to be one of the movies that, that gives you your money's worth, you know, like, uh, um, you'll have a, it, it's a true night out. You'll get to see some good sports, you'll laugh, uh, hopefully you get carried away in a great story, you see some good fights and some good action, and, you know, it's like an old, old-fashioned night out, hopefully. Cool. That, uh, the Trailer Park Boys reference does it for me. <laughs> and Ben-Hur, that's right. Good. Uh, um, and we have Adam McGoyan's uh, cinematographer shot it. Which, Paul Sorosi. Uh, yeah, man. Oh, nice. And so whenever <laughs> He's we were, a great cinematographer. Yeah, just, just a little, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so we'd be like, anytime we were doing sort of, you know, goonier type untoward stuff, you know, bodily fluids and shit, I'd be like, you shot the sweet here after. <laughs> I'd, be, like, I'd be like, hope you're happy with yourself. <laughs> 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 You sh you've shot every Adam McGoyan movie. <laughs> it's always good to diversify. Yeah, indeed. Uh, the um, and and it's it's also I mean the cast is a lot of the people from from the first Goom and Alicia Cuthbert. Yeah, I think, almost and, everyone. Uh, T.J. Miller from yeah. uh, She's Out of My League. Yeah, almost uh, everyone from the first film is back. Um, uh, the the sort of uh, new additions are uh, uh, Wyatt Russell, who plays our sort of for lack of a better term villain uh, Anders Kane. And Wyatt um, is was a pro hockey player himself. He also comes from a pretty crazy showbiz pedigree in that he is the son of Kurt Russell and Goldie Hawn. <laughs> and when he was like uh, nine or ten uh, in California, and he was getting real good at hockey, they uh, moved to Canada. And so there was a decade there where uh, Kurt Russell and Goldie Hawn moved first to Vancouver and then to Toronto because they thought that that would be the best possible hockey education for Wyatt. And um, and Wyatt is 
a hell of an actor and uh, and also can skate like a motherfucker. And so it's like we really lucked out. And and what he does in this movie, you know, it's it's incredible because like so. Kurt is, is someone that's quite dear to me and a friend of mine. And when he first started telling me that Wyatt was like trying, you know, starting to get into acting, I immediately had that sort of, you know, when your friend tells you to give notes on say, like, oh fuck, what if it sucks kind of thing, you know? And, and I was like, oh, but I'll be, keep an eye out. And then I watched this movie, Cold in July, which is one of my favorite films of the last five years. And I was like, who's this bad guy? And I Google him, and sure enough, it's fucking Wyatt. And I'm like, thank you, I don't have to lie. <laughs> and now I have this great evidence that he knows what he's doing. And so we have him, uh, the great Callum Keith Rennie, who plays his father, uh, yeah, TJ Miller, uh, Brandon Prust, Tyler Sagan, Michael Del Sato, George Peros, Colt Knorr, um, Lord, I'm gonna forget a bunch of people, but uh, but yeah, and uh, and Jay Baruchel. <laughs> so, <laughs> and and Leave is back in. Is he and, ever? Uh, yeah, Leave yeah. Schreiber's uh, in charge, large and in charge. Cool. Um, I think we, uh, maybe we'll jump. Um, uh, you've been spending, uh, in addition to. Um, in addition to directing Goon 2 uh, and being lovesick, you've also, you just finished a season of, uh, uh, of Man Seeking Woman. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is, as I mentioned before, I thought one of the funniest sitcoms I've seen in many years. Agreed. Um, Thank you. Thanks. I think maybe we should uh, show, show, just show a clip about that so you guys are aware of it, and then we'll open the floor <coughs> uh, for some questions. Uh, why don't we see the clip from Man Seeking Woman? Please. Thanks. Well, I think we've all eaten beans with a pen <laughs> at some point. Uh, you know, things happen. Yeah. Uh, how did that? How did this show develop? It's, it, it's Simon Rich is the yeah. showrunner, and yeah. it's based on his, his short uh, story collection. Yeah, the book of short stories, Last Girlfriend on Earth. Um, I uh, really just I was lucky, super lucky. They they uh, sent me this pilot, and um, I like. It, inhaled it in about five minutes and laughed out loud the whole time. Uh, but at that time, circumstances dictated that I didn't think I was available to do anything. And so I had to sort of, with a heavy heart, uh, pass on it. Um, and then uh, I went off and did my own thing, and I suppose they did too. Uh, two, three months went by, and for whatever reason, they still hadn't found their guy, and it came back to me, and it was just a bit of a... Uh, Kismet, or whatever you want to call it, and um, and yeah, I just like it was just very very cool for me to find something that I have like nothing to do with creatively, uh, in terms of writing or constructing it, um, that it feels like I wrote it. You know, like that was like the biggest compliment I could pay Simon. I was like, you write like how I imagine I do. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I just like, yeah, it's great, and 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 we've gotten to do it here, and and we get to like, you know, um, Toronto's front and center in this thing, and that's uh, and not just like it's, 
not just in a service capacity. You know, our uh, Bobby Shore, uh, DP of the first Goon, shot the first season. Uh, Sammy Nia, uh, local cinematographer, shot the second season. Our production designer Anthony Ianni did uh, Goon Two, and uh, and Book of Negroes does that. And like, so uh, Paul Jones's special effects are on display here. So it's just like I'm real proud that we get to do this this show that, for my money, is the funniest show on TV. Uh, that feels like no other show on TV, um, and and we get to do it here, and I, and I and 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 it's being here only contributes to its otherness and its differentness, and kind of like there's a reason people dig it, you know, and um, and uh, yeah, it's it's been it's been like I'm pretty lucky to have this job. Yeah, I'm a hundred percent for sure. There is no other show where the lead character dates a troll. No, uh, no. Or, literally or a troll. Or fucks a car, or. Uh, <laughs> Has a monster ejaculate in his face, and uh, yeah. all sorts of just a high point after high point. Yeah. <laughs> just trying to make mom proud. And th those are the, <laughs> the those are the tame parts, actually. Yeah. Um, so uh, we're going to start the Q and A with uh, some questions from our next wave committee, um, and then uh, there's mics in the crowd, so just raise your hand, and we'll try to get to you. Uh, go ahead. Uh, so I'm a huge fan of the Trotsky and especially your performance in the Trotsky. Thanks. So I'm just yeah yeah. Um, so I'm just wondering, <laughs> have you found any influences that you know, if if not quite as large as um, your character in the Trotsky had with uh, with Trotsky, have you found any influences that you know are along those lines in your career, your life, I guess? Like uh, like historical figures that kind of mean maybe a lot historical to me. figures if you wanna that sort go of there. like mean a lot to me kind of thing. <laughs> yeah yeah. Um, well, you know, uh, not that I think I'm, I'll put it out there, I, I don't believe I'm the reincarnation of any historical figure of importance. Uh, if I'm the reincarnation of anybody, it was, you know, Steve Adores and, you know, like just very, you know, commoners. Uh, um, my family, a proud line of commoners. Uh, that's not your question. This is not, has nothing to do with the question you asked me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's a start. So, so yeah. it's a start. Uh, um, so yeah, uh, to answer your question, I'd have to go uh, uh, Hitchcock, uh, uh, Churchill, and then uh, and then there's an American dude called uh, Brigadier General Smedley Butler that, uh, as hilariously as he's named, uh, it's actually kind of a terrible thing that like Americans have no idea who he is, let alone us. But uh, I'll just say this: that uh, without him. The story of uh, the second half of the 20th century is uh, is completely different and not in a good way. So, so those will be, I guess, hopefully, kind of an answer to your question. And sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi. So since this is next wave, I was just wondering if you had any advice for any young filmmakers or young people trying to get into film. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I'll preface it by saying, like, you know. What the fuck do I know about anything uh, to start with? Uh, um, no, uh, I, I think like it's gonna be. It's weird. I, I, it's one. It's gonna be one of these things that sounds obvious but just isn't. Which is like just kind of do it. Just always find a way to do it. You know, like like uh, ideas are are all but completely worthless. An idea without sort of anything realized from it uh, is is meaningless, and it costs you know it's, it's it's real cheap too, and and so to me as I like you know what what I've learned and I'm constantly reminded of is it's not my idea and it's not even how I articulate my idea, it's it's the idea how I articulate it, how I'm able to then live with it and defend it, um, you know the, 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 there's like plenty of times that life will kick the shit out of you. There's like you know a, a movie. Every movie is a miracle, and, and it's such a cool thing when one happens. And, and because think about how many people are involved, how many people off in their own little lives come together to tell and find a, you know, try and find a way to tell this story. And there's so many things that you have no control over, from money, uh, the weather, uh, whether people show up or not. Blah, there's just a bunch of things that you have no control over that are going to constantly test you, um, and it's going to be the difference between whether a movie happens or doesn't is can you take that hit on the chin and keep going? You know, the first time someone closes a door or the first, you know, time someone doesn't want to do your movie or then, they, okay, we didn't get the money or that location fell through or it's going to be, it's going to be snowing and we had to be outside or any of these things. It's how you react to them 
and can you find a way to keep doing it, right? And and uh, and I'll say this that like, you know, and now it's after the fact, so my producers can hear this. But like I kept saying, like uh, during Goon Two pre-production, I'd have shot that movie in our production office, you know, if I had to. It'd have looked like shit. Our stadium would have been a kitchen, but like <laughs> I'd have found a way, because if the option is not making a movie, right? If that's the, if the when you always distill it down to that, you know, and and so. And don't wait. That's the other thing. It's like, it's funny. Like I, I, I hit the age of thirty, and all of a sudden, this loud clock I could hear, and, and it was all of a sudden like, I, uh, for better or for worse, I was no longer uh, uh, immortal. Uh, when bad shit happened in my twenties and teen years, well, this is just going to be my life forever, you know. And and conversely, when shit's going well when you're young, I was, oh man, fucking doing ninety on Easy Street. Well, no, it's it's all cyclical. It's all finite, and so, but what you do have is a very specific amount of time that we call a life. And, you, and, and from the point that you kind of are able to do something in it until you die, I see it as like a window to do shit. And so um, there's no reason not to. If you have a story worth telling, there's no reason why it shouldn't be typed up already. If there's a story, a script you have to shoot, there's no reason why you, ha you shouldn't shoot it already. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I guess something, something like that. <laughs> Good advice. Thanks. Uh, uh, who's got the, whoever's got the mic? Yeah, maybe if you, if you have the mic, if you can stand up so we can All see. Right. Go ahead. I'm going to go back to Man Seeking Woman because I absolutely love the show. I think it's unique and, like, I've never seen anything like it on television. Cool. So I have to ask you if you can relate any of your personal dating experiences <laughs> to any episodes or scenarios yeah. on the show. No. Come no. on, Jay. No, I... <laughs> I refuse. <laughs> I, I absolutely refuse. Yeah, I, um, just say that, uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, dating fucking sucks, and uh, and it's uh, just a constant exercise in degradation, and uh, and I am uh, not independent of that. Uh, so um, we've all we've all gotten our hands dirty. Um, ugh. Uh, <laughs> Uh, very, I, we'll move on. Yeah. Oh wait, no, but you did do you did do research with the didn't you do like some online stuff like dating type things? Oh Jesus! Uh, uh, yeah, I, I yeah, for, I did. I had an eHarmony account for a minute, uh, and uh, absolutely not. No, I am very anti fucking Tinder. I think that like. Uh, we're only now starting to see the repercussions of what a you know generation of that will do. I think, uh, I think it trivializes things too much, and uh, and it takes the danger out of it. And you should you should have skin in the game, and you should fucking be risking something when you go out there. That's how you know. What's you know? What is it? You used to have to work for something for fuck's sake. What is this? What is this? That's nothing. <laughs> this is nothing. And you're, not, you're only supposed to swipe one way, right? It's left or right. I don't know what Tinder is, so it's some online thing, right? It's a phone thing, right? Yeah. Um, not a rotary phone. Uh, uh, oh, next. Hi. Um, I'm Rebecca. Hi there. Uh, right now I'm working two jobs to just kind of keep a roof over my head, and I was wondering um, if you had any, any advice for a writer, an actor, who's trying to... Um, audition and submit for things that don't necessarily fall in line with what I want to do in yeah. my life um, and how to maintain integrity in doing those cheap jobs that are a paycheck yeah. but that are kind of soul crushing yeah. versus creating my own content that will not garner much money but will yet. enrich my soul. Yet, by the way, that's a yet thing. You know, like I, I, I think that like, so the, the, the first depressing statistic is that like less than 20% of actors can feed themselves from acting alone right and so and and uh, girls are at an even higher disadvantage cuz there's more actresses than there are actors but more port parts for us than there are for you guys and they're far crueler to you guys as well because they give girls basically two windows of opportunity for the most part and so uh, so for me how i reconciled it was like uh, I always, even if I'm not like a massive 
fan, he was always a huge inspiration. Is is like I I'd be lying if I said is I, I adore the movies he's directed, but they mean a great deal in terms of an, as an inspiration. It's like John Cassavetes, right? Like, and he 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 acted basically to pay the bills. And he acted and stuff that like, he, there was no job he was too good for as an actor. But what that afforded him the chance and the money to do was to go off and make these crazy little independent films with his buddies that like nobody in their right mind would bankroll. You know, like that's, I, and so, so this is all to say that like, you, you make the most of every fucking opportunity you, you can. And because, you know, you gotta feed yourself and you gotta subsist and you gotta, but, Never miss an op opportunity of free time when you're not working and you're not working on a shitty audition you don't care about when you're just sitting. Uh, don't let yourself, like, use that time to keep creating your stuff and find a way to create it and find a way to do it and find a place to put it on and just find a way, just do it, you know, and, and know that at a certain point um, you will get to, you know, you, you, you will... The terrible fucking thing we all have to go through. That's just like that. You just have to put your time in, and you have to go through it, and and you have to audition and be beholden to people that you don't care about, uh, for a job that you just there's no way on earth I would ever watch this thing. If someone paid me money, I would never watch this. But it's in front of me, and if I do this and I kill this, well, that means I don't have to go do this other shitty job. That means I have that much more free time that I can go and write and do my own thing. Plus, plus. Every shitty job, you're gonna meet someone. You're gonna meet some other cool, like-minded artist who's like just doing their time, at, you know, clocking in like you are. That then you're gonna work with on, like, you know what I mean? Like, there's there's an opportunity to be found in all of them, and so just fight for them when you can get them. I guess. Yeah. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Um, I think we got somebody back there. Yeah. Uh, being someone who speaks so respectfully and passionately about Canadian cinema and, you know, your, your, your history is primarily in acting, but you say that you've always wanted to write and direct movies. Where do you see your future in Canadian cinema? Like, do you want to continue more primarily as an actor or are you, are you seeing Goon 2 as your bridge slowly to what your dream is? Um, well, thanks. Thanks for the kind words. Uh, um, uh, no, I'll, okay, I'll be, I'll be perfectly honest that like, uh, there's a version of things that if if man if man seeking woman uh, uh, doesn't come back for a season three, then yeah, hiccup uh, in How to Train Your Dragon might be my last gig, um, because I I I, I really um, as 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 much as I've uh, have a great love and a respect for acting, and it's really given me and my mom and my sister just lives we just never would have otherwise had, and I it was always my means of getting onto set, right? I wasn't in movies because I loved acting. I was in acting because I loved movies. And so for me, I've been wait like I started acting when I was 12, but it's at nine when I said to mom, I want to be a director. So even when I started at 12, she said to me, you, you want to go to film school one day. Well, this, this set will be, this will be your, the best film school you could find. So for, for me, um, I hope my my hope is that yeah, Goon is the, is the beginning. Goon two is the beginning of the next phase. Again, w whether or not anyone ever allows me to direct another movie uh, remains to be seen. Um, uh, so I, I take nothing for granted. Um, but uh, but yeah, this is that's kind of like I I I really love writing and I really love directing and um, and I'm kind of sick of wearing foundation and shit. So. <laughs> Hey, I think we, we have someone there. Hi, yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask, as like a direct, as an actor on set, especially working with other actors, when you're acting, you usually work on cues. But when you're on set for something like The Sorcerer's Apprentice, where mm -hmm. a lot of stuff that's made in that film is made in post production, mm -hmm. how does it feel <laughs> acting? <like> ridiculous. <laughs> Absolutely ridiculous. And you're just like. I fucking really hope they make this look cool, because <laughs> I'm gonna look like an asshole. Uh, I remember distinctly being in uh, Battery Park with Nicolas Cage and, and, and Monica Bellucci, and there's the three of us, um, obviously not actually shooting energy out of our hands, um, <laughs> but, but, but acting like we are, and making all sorts of ah! exertion sounds and like, and and I was just like, fuck guys, like we're putting a lot of faith in these people, aren't we? Like 
because this could really, this could really look like shit. Um, so yeah, no, you just like, so it. That's when it really pays to have been one of those like cops and robbers kids that like had a real active imagination and was always running around playing, because like I, I've never had that problem. They're always like, but when there's not a real dragon, you know, coming after you, I'm like. <laughs> So yeah, if that was the issue, if I had to actually believe everything and every time I wanted to act, I'd probably shot myself years ago. But, uh, um, but uh, no, I, I think you and you just have to hope hope to God that it turns out okay and doesn't look like dog shit when all is said and done with it. But if it does, it's not your fault. It did, it did look good. I uh, agree. That one yeah, turned out the, good. The plasma bolts looked. They did. Impressive. Yeah, they did. Uh, way at the back. Hey, Jay Baruchel, uh, long-time listener, first-time caller. <laughs> so many things to talk to you about, man. I would love to hear stories from you about what it was like to sit with Seth and your friends on the set of This Is The End or what you did in Hawaii with Robert Downey Jr. and Ben Stiller at night. Uh, and I, I hope one day... <laughs> you know, if you're going to have sex with a car, those guys are around too. Uh, yeah, I hope enough. one day you actually write a, a book about your father. I'd love to hear a million more stories about your dad. But the, the, the question that I want to uh, be take this selfish time to talk to you about tonight is, uh, dude, spending a day on set with Rush. Yeah. <laughs> what was it like to hang out with Rush and then at the end of the day have them tell you that you're an official member of the band? Yeah, it's pretty cool. And I've got the, uh, the bass to show for it as well. Uh, um, yeah, that thing is just like, again, it, Every once in a while, like one of the cooler parts of my weird life is that, like, yeah, I I could text Getty Lee, <laughs> which is like fucking insane, you know. And I know that it's never lost on me. Um, no, but basically, uh, how that all worked out real quick is just Getty's uh, one of my bosses on something that uh, he's a producer. Technically, he's a producer on uh, on one of the gigs that Jesse and I got hired to write. We adapted this book. And um, and he was just sort of, yeah, our boss. And uh, no movie happens overnight. And so over four or five years of trying to get it made, uh, yeah, I got, I ended up, I'm now in two of their concerts. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm in the, the, the last tour as well. Yeah, so uh, I'm fine being synonymous with uh, the gr biggest band ever to come out of this fucking country. <laughs> so pretty huge. It's a burden. It's, but, yeah, uh, I, I, I'll take it. I'll shoulder <laughs> it. Uh, next. Yeah. Uh, hi, Jay. Hi uh, Jay, I was, uh, I'm a big fan of your character in Almost Famous. Oh, uh, cool. Vic. Thanks. Uh, mostly because I'm a huge Led Zeppelin fan, oh, but cool. just young enough that I actually miss Led Zeppelin. So I, I always, I'm kind of jealous of that character. But the question I have is, in that movie, there was another actor by the name of uh, Fee, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman. Oh, yeah. And my, my question is, uh, I also, I loved his character in that movie, is uh, did you get a chance to meet uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman? And if so, uh, did you learn anything from him? And, and what was he all about? Uh, no, I didn't. Uh, um, I didn't. He wasn't around any of the days that I uh, came down um, to the stage to do that one. Um, uh, but... I got to be there, you know, I got to uh, play Frisbee with Cameron Crowe and, and pick his brain about movies, and he had just gotten, he had just finished, it hadn't come out yet, he had just finished writing his Billy Wilder book, and so um, we talked a lot of Billy Wilder, and in between takes, which was huge, he didn't have to do that for me, and um, I mean, it's a crazy thing for me, it was just like my first American gig ever, it was the first time I'd ever been on a set outside of Canada, and there's mom and I, and I was 17, and uh, and I come down to LA, and um, I, on on what is considered a mid-sized project down there, which is still one of the bigger movies I've ever been on, and um, yeah, it was it was crazy, but it's definitely one of those one of those moments, um, one of those experiences, I should say, that like I was just trying to keep my head up, keep my head above water. Like there's so much. I was 17 years old, so much to process, so many personalities and shit, and. Uh, it's only as I've gotten older that I'm able to truly appreciate what a kind of cool, cool experience that was. Uh, my personal favorite from that set uh, was uh, when we shot in New York, uh, these two construction workers walking past. Uh, <laughs> they saw all of our period uh, cars and clothing, and it was these two black guys like, they make a new, a new super, <laughs> super fly. <laughs> I was like, so. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, Mom, they think we're shooting Superfly, which is like, that was my father's favorite movie. Superfly is a huge one. 
It's a great flick. I'm glad the question was about Seymour Hoffman. I thought we were going to have a battle of the bands there. Uh, and not about Superfly, anyway. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, do we have someone? Oh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Whoever's got the mic. Uh, it, it's kind of crazy to see you in person. Uh, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and be as quick as possible. Um, I'm actually uh, an American here as a student for undergrad, and I plan to go back there afterwards. So I wanted to ask, like, um, what would be like the legitimate first concrete steps that one would have to take if they wanted to be like an actor or a screenwriter and like with, between cities like LA mm. versus New York? Um, those, are, those are questions that have been on my mind the past uh, couple months. And also, just as an aside, is there ever going to be a sequel to This is the End? <laughs> it's my favorite comedy film. Hey, thanks, man. I'm glad you like it. Um, uh, Concrete first step. Uh, I don't know that there's any right or wrong way. I mean, there, okay, that's not. Just, I don't know. If there's any right way. There's a bunch of wrong ways, uh, um, and and there's definitely ways like red flags to sort of steer clear of, at least in terms of personalities. Um, uh, but that's a hard one. What city is a good? I, I, I suspect that like either you could do a lot worse than either of those two places if you're trying to make a go of it as a writer or as an actor. Um, but I, I think that uh, before things can get official, you know, before you, you, it's all a blipping on someone's radar, right? And and you're I guess official when you have an agent. They're sending out on auditions. I suspect is what you mean by official. Well, you still got to find a way to blip on that agent's radar. And so I guess this is all comes back to there's no reason not to always be doing it, right? There's like, if you've got, you know, a weekend, you should be, you know, writing or making a short film or, you know, and, and by the way, the difference, you know, and this is, like I said, I'm going to be 34, so this will be a, a bit of an age difference, is like the benefit you guys have now is that there's now a medium for all this shit. You know, which is a blessing and a curse, by the way. Like, um, I was talking about this with friends of mine that, like, we were talking about, would we have preferred that there was YouTube when we were in high school? And and I don't actually know that we would because, like, grade 11 was the year that we all made movies every weekend. And that was just what we did after school. We just made movies all the time, and we would edit them and then watch them ourselves. And we got a little film festival going at the high school, but we made them, I hate to sound like fucking... Hack, you know, hacky artist dude here, but like we made them for us and for our friends and maybe their parents and the teachers, but that's about it. Had had there been a YouTube when we were making these things, we would have made them with an eye for an audience and views and hits and all of this different shit. That I I I wonder, like there's plenty of time for that, you know that that's what it is to do it professionally. So there's plenty of time to think about that, but I do think that you have to. I, I just I wouldn't trade anything for that period where I was just making movies for the sake of making movies because I liked watching movies and I wanted to make them. Um, so I guess basically keep find a way to always write, find a way to always act, find a way to do them together, and and now you have a place to put them and and at a certain and like and by the way, in 2016 that's enough. Like it seems like pe there are people that are getting careers in music and in acting and in cinema off of YouTube channels. And so, which again, blessing and a curse, but I would say as a concrete first step in any artistic endeavor, just find a way to do it, probably. Thank you. At the back, yeah. Uh, hey, Jay. Um, you're hilarious. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> uh, my question is based around Canadian comedy. Uh, as one of the, I guess, more iconic people yeah, of the current age in Canadian comedy. How Thanks. do you see Canadian comedy moving forward and where it's at right now in comparison to the U.S. markets? Oh, um, I, 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 th I say same as it ever was, it, with, the, with, the, with the, the, the one difference being that uh, we now have the chance of like, stuff getting big up here, and, it, and, that's, okay, and that's enough. Um, for the longest time, it was do what you can up here so that you can get to work down there. You know, you, or I mean, World War II was do what you can here so you can go to work in England. And then after those, do what you can here so you can go to work in the States. But what I'll say is, like, there's never been a time where there weren't Canadians in U.S. show business, right? Like, 
uh, the very first stars of Hollywood, Mary Pickford is Canadian. There, there's always a time where we've been there. Like they, they, they have always, you know, we've always made up the rank and file. And so this is to, like, so at the start of SNL. So I guess what, what, why I said same as it ever was is we've been funny, we've been doing our own thing, we will, we will always. And we will always be informing what the American sense of humor is as a result. Um, the cool thing now with something like, I, and I credit Trailer Park Boys for doing this, that it got big, it got massive within Canada, and there was no caveats, there was no, it's good for a Canadian, thing. it was just good, and none of us were waiting for it to blip on anyone else's radar. And, uh, and it eventually did, and it's legitimately you know, exportable and huge elsewhere, but, um, but it opened up the chance for us to, like, it just showed that we could watch, we could make stuff that we would watch, and that would be enough. I think that's a good way to end it, actually. Uh, I'm going to uh, be right back. I just got to pee real quick. So should I? Oh, OK. Oh, no, we're going to stop, actually. Oh, we're going to stop. OK, good. <laughs> we're going to make it. It's good. good. Uh, thank you thank so much you, for doing please. this. Uh, awesome. It was OK. It was a good yeah, one. Yeah, it was great. Thank you, everyone. Back. I'm just going to pee real quick.